All right. So um, today we are going to cover kind of an overview of pathogenicity factors and virulence factors. Um, what I wanted to do was first to kind of walk through an example. I, I, I had kind of been thinking about how to do this lecture, and at first I was like, we'll do a case study, and then last yesterday afternoon I was like, I don't want to create a case study, and then I got home and I was like, well, I guess I'm doing it anyway. So it's kind of a hybrid. I'm going to explain a process, and we're going to draw it out. Okay, We're going to draw out how does streptococcus pneumoniae cause an infection. And then what we're going to do afterwards is go back and identify what are the virulence factors based on what we talked about. Okay? There are more questions on the sheet than I anticipate we will get through today, and that is perfectly fine because you may recall Monday we've got kind of this built-in extra day to just continue to review immunology and, and refresh a little bit since it's been a couple of weeks since we've talked about it. Um, so we'll finish this up, and then I'll have some other questions for us to work on. On uh, there, right there. a couple of papers, uh, a couple of other things for us to work on on Monday as well. Um, anticipate that over the weekend the lectures for vaccines will come up. I'm working on the mini lectures right now, so you should see that coming up by the end of the weekend, barring any like disasters at home. So. Um, any questions before we get started? Okay. Last week, guys, big push, okay? You guys are doing really good. I know that things are going tough for every class. You can do it. You're all winners, to quote a line from Seinfeld, okay? Austin, pick up a couple of papers. All right. Here it comes. Yeah, I need to schedule that. I was going to do Wednesday. Um, what I was anticipating was we'd do like a, a 4 to 6 o'clock on Wednesday. I just need to schedule it, but that's my plan. Um, thanks for asking that, too. So times review, obviously, is one way. And then I am going to be around Thursday, Friday, even if people are deciding whether they're going to take it Monday or Wednesday, I will be around also all day Tuesday, all day Monday, Wednesday morning, blah, blah, blah. So I will be around. All right. Any other questions about that right now? All right. Let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to focus right now just on strep pneumonia. Okay. And um, strep pneumonia is one of the organisms that can actually cause meningitis. So actually, we do have a vaccine against strep pneumonia. And this might be something that we come back to on Wednesday next week when we talk about types of vaccines. Eventually, we're going we're gonna to change focus just slightly to talk about strep pyogenes, which is the cause of strep throat and scarlet fever. Scarlet fever is actually making a comeback right now, and folks don't really know why. Um, the cases of, of uh, scarlet fever went way down in the 60s, 70s, 80s, etc., as antibiotics came available to treat strep infections. Before then, oftentimes there was a correlation between strep throat. If your immune system didn't fight off, usually it would end up leading to scarlet fever as well. And the fever itself, or the rash that would occur with scarlet fever, is really just inflammation. So we'll come back to that, because that, that brings up a couple of very important characteristics about strep pyogenes. OK, so just to orient you with this picture to begin with, uh, this, was, uh, this was a 7 o'clock in the morning drawing. So this is not the greatest. And this is about my basic understanding of, of anatomy and physiology. Um, so on the top here, we have epithelium, and this would be your mucosal epithelium. So th just above this, you might see what kind of look like some whisks. This would be the mucus layer. Below that is the mucus epithelium, and then we've got below that extracellular matrix. Okay, so fibrinogen, plasminogen, 
other connective tissue that would be just below that epithelium. Um, strep pyogenes typically gains entry into the body through what we would call a portal of entry. This is not a term I asked you to, to be aware of, but just to give you an idea of what that means, portal of entry is basically any route by which an organism can gain access and cause disease. Um, common ways, uh, gas through the oral fecal route, so in through the mouth. Inhalation through the nose is another possible way. Uh, cuts, scrapes are another portal of entry. Anything that disrupts that, what we would call the first line of defense, skin and mucus layers. What we find is that strep pneumonia in particular gains entry most often or most frequently uh, through essentially in part it's aerosolization. So breathing it in uh, either through the mouth or through the nose. And typically what we think of when we think of meningitis, this th really what this location that we're talking about is the nasal pharynx. What is the nasal pharynx? Anybody know? What's nasal? Nose. So the nasopharynx is basically top of the throat, right behind the nose. <coughs> we have a lot of mucus there, okay? Uh, and, and mucus, in, in terms of immunity, is really, really good. It traps microorganisms. Uh, also, we will find in a mucus layer high concentrations of IgA. What is IgE? What does this stand for, or what, what's another term that we use for this? Yeah, immunoglobulin or antibody. So IgA is just a specific type of antibody that we find at very high concentrations within <coughs> mucous membranes. Oftentimes, we consider these as being neutralizing antibodies. But remember, the process of an antibody coding a pathogen, what's the term that we use to describe that process? This is one that we brought up a couple of weeks ago. Great review. I'll give you a minute to look it up. See if you can find it real quick for your notes. It starts with an O. And if we have to, we'll play some hangman today. Oh, crud, I've run out of space. Should we play hangman? One round? Well, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it's opsonization. So opsonins are, or opsonization is the process of that antibody coating the surface of the pathogen. What's the benefit of that again? Right, so the phagocytes we said have these FC receptors on their surface, which will help with the, the process of phagocytosis. So um, the IgAs will help to trap the bacteria, also to some extent allow for phagocytes to phagocytize them. Okay. Questions on, on that so far, the setup of where we're at? Okay. We'll consider this middle area, the bloodstream, or blood vessels. And then this here is endothelium. And this is going to, in our case, going to create our blood-brain barrier. Just to kind of orient you to everything. So in this process, first thing that happens, strep pneumonia gets into the body. Cocci bacterium, oftentimes found maybe in doubles or a longer chain, has a capsule which protects it from what? A lot of people know this. Yeah, phagocytosis in particular. Um, as it enters, the first thing it has to do is to attach. 
or to bind to the cells so that it can begin to colonize. Well, the way that this happens, at least in the case of strep pneumoniae, is that there are receptors on the surface of these epithelium, and they are known as IGRs, immunoglobulin receptor. These ones in particular, their job is to actually br um, bring immunoglobulin A to the surface, and that's not really important. But what we do need to know is that this is a receptor that strep pneumonia attaches to. When it attaches to it, it does so with a protein. Oh, that's a horrible drawing. Strep pneumonia does so with a protein known as C uh, B. Ah. Okay. CBPA attaches to the IGR. It actually gets internalized then into the host cell and transmigrates from one end of that cell to the extracellular matrix or that, that basal tissue that's lying right underneath the epithelial layer, that connective tissue that's holding it together. Once it gets here, there are a couple of other proteins that are involved in making sure that the bacteria can colonize or attach to the tissue. And those proteins are known as PAV-A and enolase. Um, these help the organism to attach to fibronectin and plasminogen. Okay. I'm giving the detail here right now, not because I expect you to know this for the exam, but just to kind of give you some context, okay? instead of just saying like protein A and protein B, blah, blah, blah. So that helps them to attach, and at some point then, what's going to happen is strep pneumonia is going to start to secrete a protein known as hyaluronidase. Uh, and hyaluronidase is also known, and sometimes it's referred to as spreading factor. It breaks down the, uh, not only the epithelium, but also will start to break down this extracellular matrix as well and allows for strep pneumonia to gain entry to the bloodstream. And so at this point, we have bacteremia, bacteria within the bloodstream. In here, there's a lot of things that happen. And it's actually quite, it's a little bit confusing, and, and we don't totally understand the reason why all of this happens. So I'm just going to kind of explain the couple, a couple of events. One, at really high concentrations, strep pneumonia actually induces its own lysis. In other words, there is a protein known as lit A or um, lytic or lysin A, autolysin A, that helps to induce these strep pneumonia to basically burst. When they burst, they end up releasing other proteins known as pneumolysin. Pneumolysin's an exotoxin. It is a toxin that has the ability to lyse red blood cells. It has the ability to lyse other uh, eh, red blood cells within the bloodstream. Um, there's many benefits of that to the organism that we will just not talk about right now. But one of the ways that you can tell if you have strep pneumonia uh, if you're doing a clinical test, is to actually streak the bacteria onto what we know, what we call blood auger, uh, which contains sheep's blood. The blood auger will create halos around the organism if the organism has hemolytic activity, if it has the ability to break down those red blood cells or cause them to lice. Next step in this process, eventually the strep pneumonia is going to make its way to the blood-brain barrier, and we're going to get another binding event here between 
CBPA and another protein on the surface of these cells, uh, which is known as RPATH, or PATH receptor. This process, again, triggers a transmigration or an endocytosis and exocytosis to the other side. And in that case, then, that allows for strep pneumonia to penetrate this blood-brain barrier and now get into the brain. And if, you, if there's one thing to know about the brain when it comes to immunology, we think of it typically as being pretty immunodeficient. Um, we don't see a lot of neutrophils, macrophages, because that would be bad. We don't want inflammation in the brain particularly. And in the cases of meningitis, what we get are some of that inflammation. We also get toxic pro production by strep pneumonia, which can lead to some of the side effects of this. So in that condition, then, what we have is the ability of strep pneumonia to replicate, reproduce without any sort of um, repercussions from the immune system. Any questions on this general process? I'll give you guys a minute to think first before. Devin. Is that L-I-T-A, like light, lighted vein, like makes it secrete the Yeah, it's really interesting. So pneumolysin isn't actually secreted from the cell per se. It's only released when these cells explode or... or are light. So, and, and we don't understand, I don't think we understand what the benefit of this lysis is. It seems counterproductive, doesn't it? Um, but what we know is that the lysis of the streptococci will release <coughs> proteins like pneumolysin. That's beneficial to the organism. It also triggers an incredibly strong immune response. So what we find is part of the pathogenicity of this organism, part of the signs and symptoms that get caused are inflammation, <coughs> swelling, pain. And that's all caused by the lysis in combination with the pneumolysin and other proteins that are being secreted and could be considered antigens as well. So do they, do the pneumolysins, do they have like a function besides like causing like so the pneumolysins, their function is to lyse red blood cells and lyse other cells. In, in a microorganism, there's a benefit to lysing red blood cells. What gives red blood cells their red color? Iron. I don't know, I think we've talked about this so very briefly, but iron's typically a limiting resource for microorganisms. Okay? And so you could assume that the lysis of those red blood cells is actually quite beneficial you release the iron or the hemoglobin, and now there is free iron that the organism can scavenge and use to promote its growth. So there's another pathogenicity factor or, or virulence factor that we haven't really talked about in here that's required for uh, disease by strep pneumonia and other bacteria, and those are what we call siderophores. Or sometimes, and the other term for that is just it's an iron, iron scavenging molecule that will bind it up, um, it's secreted by the microorganism, and then the organism has receptors on its surface that will bind to those iron scavengers and allow them to bring the iron into the microorganism so that it can promote its growth. So there is a benefit to it. We don't, obviously we don't look at that as a benefit, but there is a benefit to the life cycle of the organism. Erica. So it binds to this RPATH protein on the surface, and when this happens, it actually triggers the cell to begin endocytosis of the RPATH receptor. So there's an endocytosis on, uh, on one end, and then it actually will be exocytosed on the opposite side of that endothelium layer, and that allows it to penetrate the blood-brain barrier. Other questions? Okay. I did want to show... Oh, go ahead, Brian. What does PAV-A and ENO do again? So PAV-A and ENO allow the organism to bind to 
uh, fib fibronectin plasminogen within the extracellular matrix. Okay. So it actually helps them to colonize below this epithelial layer. Um, can I erase this? Is that okay with everyone? So the one other thing I wanted to show on here was, I, I kind of, this is my crappy rendition of strep pneumonia. Um, I just wanted to kind of point out a couple of these proteins where they're located so that you have an idea. Um, this outermost layer here would be our capsule. And you can see that the capsule actually covers many of these proteins. Um, this one right down here at the bottom is our CBPA. Below the capsule we have what thick protein and polysaccharide layer. Do all gram positives have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan or cell wall? So this is our cell wall. Oops. And the lit A protein or that autolysis is actually residing within, when it's expressed, it's residing within that cell wall. So it actually performs a very similar function as does lysozyme. And some of those other enzymes we've talked about throughout the semester that lyse uh, gram-positive and gram-negative cells. Kayla. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think if I, if I understand the literature correctly, what turns it on is basically an abundance of cells. So bacterial cells have this, they, they have a way to actually communicate with each other through small molecules, the process is known as quorum sensing. So if you think of the term quorum, it means that you have to have a certain threshold of people in order to, when we think politics, in order to have a vote or in order to have a meeting. Quorum sensing in the bacterial world means at a certain threshold of cells, there's enough of this molecule around that triggers some sort of response. And that's how I understand that this lit A protein is produced, is once you have an abundance of those cells, <laughs> They begin, some of them will begin to turn on this lead A. Yeah. Which is probably a good thing. You don't want a cell just at random undergoing lysis because it's the end of its life cycle, right? Okay. Um, the other two that I've highlighted over here um, are our PAV-A and enolase. And then inside the cell, we actually have two sets of, of proteins. One of them was that pneumolysin. And again, this one isn't necessarily secreted. It's more released when the cell dies. The other one that is secreted is the, oh gosh, hyaluronidase. There's more virulence factors than just this set. Okay, there's more than just this set of proteins, but these are just kind of the, the major ones that I wanted to point out. Um, I am going to write down two other ones. Uh, staph, or sorry, strep pneumonia has what we call an IgA protease. Anybody recall what a protease is? breaks down proteins. In other words, this enzyme breaks down. What's it break down? IgA. IgA. Can see where that might be a benefit to the microorganism. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. I don't want to worry about the other one. So this is the one other one that I wanted to point out that does exist in uh, that the organism does secrete and it has actually quite a benefit to its ability to uh, to survive within and to begin to colonize within the mucus epithelium. Okay. Any other questions? 
before we move on. How much of like these specific names do you want us to know? Yeah, not much. I, I really don't want you to know the specific names. I want you to know more the, the, what kind of categories that they fit into, and that's what I want to try to accomplish with this worksheet now, or these sets of questions, is, is to connect terminology with an actual example. The goal is to not remember these exact steps for streptococcus pneumoniae, but rather to know if we say that a protein is involved in attachment, what does that actually mean? Some people also actually in the homework referred to a pillus, which I haven't drawn up here, but if there is a, strep pneumonia do have pili as well that contribute to attachment. When we use the term here, attachment, of the terminology that I had you look at for homework, what does that associate with? What kinds of proteins of pathogens are associated with attachment? Hangman time. Yay. Round two. Letter, anyone? Great. Adhesins. Adhesins are proteins that do what? What is the definition of an adhesin? Meg. Yeah, it, it, it's a protein involved in attachment. So there are many examples of adhesins we've talked about throughout the semester without defining them as such. The spikes on a virus, those are examples of adhesins. They are required for the virus to gain entry into the host cell. So adhesins, they don't necessarily have to be involved in the invasion process or getting into the cell, but they have to be involved in helping the organism to colonize or gain a foothold in the host. Go ahead, Mike. So for this example, what if that is one example. So let's list them off. Let's list off what are examples of adhesins in this particular model that we've talked about. CBPA is definitely one of them. Because what do we know? The receptors for CBPA are what? Based on what we defined today. IGR. Yeah, the RPAF is the other one. Exactly. Exactly. What else is involved in attachment? Say, th those are involved in, in, in adhesion, yeah. Pave. Pave, which binds to the fibronectin. What's another one? Devin? Yeah, the enolase, which is involved in attaching to plasminogen. So those are all examples of adhesins. They if we're using the term that it's required for the organism to bind or required for the organism to attach. Those are examples of adhesins. Pili, sometimes flagella can be examples of adhesins. It be, it's dependent on the microorganism. All right. What is an invasion? You want to try, Mike? It is the, it's the enzymes that allow for invasion. And we can mean this in a couple of different ways. So one might be, usually when I think of invasion, I'm actually oftentimes thinking about invading a cell. But we can, at least in this case, expand that definition a little bit and just say invade to other tissue as well. So there are a couple of examples here of where we see invasions in the life cycle of streptococcus pneumoniae, or at least in the example that we've brought about. What are examples of invasions? Derek? Uh, the hyaluronidase. Hyaluronidase, exactly. Now, I, I said I don't want you to know specifics. That is one I do want you to know about, hyaluronidase. Okay, I just wanted to point that out. That was in the, in the mini lecture, too. So that one helps to allow the organism to break down hyaluronic acid and to get through that extracellular matrix and into the bloodstream. 
What is, there is actually one other example that we have looked at here that is an example of an invasion. Not the pneuma lysin. It's a good guess. We'll come back to that one, though. What other protein that is present on the surface of the cell allows it to transmigrate across the epithelial layer or across the endothelial layer? It's actually a protein we've already discussed. CBPA. So in this case, what this is saying is that a protein doesn't have to be defined just as one or the other. It can actually be both. CBPA is an adhesin because it's required for attachment, but it's also an invasin. It's binding to the R path, for example, on the surface of the endothelial, endothelial cells here, triggers those endothelial cells to undergo an endocytosis process. That's invasion. So gaining entry to those other cells is an example of that invasive process. Okay. So given that right there, I'm going to pause real quick. We haven't really said what that means. Haley. Yeah, it, it allows for the back. It, that's a great way to describe it. So these are molecules or proteins that allow the organism to get in and out of the host. Oftentimes, this term will be interchanged with a pathogenicity factor. Not all virulence factors are pathogenicity factors. A pathogenicity is something that is going to cause a sign and a symptom of a disease. A virulence factor allows for the organism to uh, allows for the organism, as Haley said, to get in and out. And sometimes we find that a pathogenicity factor, uh, or sometimes a virulence factor, is also a pathogenicity factor. Um, a great example here would be the pneumolysin. We know, based on literature, that pneumolysin is required for strep pneumonia to uh, get into the host cell to, and to actually uh, survive and thrive, multiply within the bloodstream. But there's a huge downside to that, right? Lysis of red blood cells, uh, well, one extreme effect of that could be anemia. Another extreme effect of this is actually it might trigger an inflammation response. And so in those cases, this can lead to some of the signs and symptoms or the pathogenicity of that illness. Okay. So there's a small distinction here. It's not, it's not huge, and we've kind of been using those terms interchangeably. What is, uh, let's take a look at the second one real quick. So explain how IgA protease uh, would allow for strep pneumonia to avoid opsonization. And, so, and maybe a picture is a good way to look at this one as well. So let's walk through the process. What, it, what is opsonization again? Okay, coating of a pathogen with an antibody. So if I have strep pneumonia, I have IgA coating it. What is this part of the antibody? that's kind of hanging off of the strep pneumonia. What do we call that region? The constant region. Sometimes the, the abbreviation we use is FC, which the C in here does not actually stand for constant, but you can think of it as that would be fine. And then these arms, what's the importance of these arms? What do they do? 
Good. And what, and what does that, those vari that variability allows for what, Derek? Or antigens, right? Or antigens on the pathogen. Exactly. Okay. There's this great cartoon. I think I put it on the final exam last year. So once I post that for you guys to look at, maybe you'll see it. But it's, it's about how giving yourself a vaccine is just, is just training your antibodies how to give hugs. Okay? Because the goal of an antibody is to hug or to coat a pathogen. All right. So those are our variable regions. An IgA protease, and this one says it cleaves between the FC and the antibody binding arms. In other words, it cleaves right here. What's the benefit of that? So what is the benefit of this to the microorganism to cleave that off? The, there's going to still be parts of antibody bound to it. Well, what's the difference between one in which it's been coated and these FC regions are hanging outward versus one where all those FC regions have been removed? What's the effect of that on the organism or on the immune response? Abby? The FC region is the part that would bind to the phagocytes. Yeah. So in that case, like this Exactly. So you may recall, we talked about how the FC region, uh, phagocytes particularly, our macrophages and our neutrophils, they have what we call FC receptors. And these are receptors on their cell surface that bind specifically to this FC region. Binding of multiple FC receptors to multiple FC regions or antibodies would essentially increase phagocytosis. It enhances or triggers the endocytosis of that pathogen, leading to its destruction in the phagolysosome. So without those being on the surface, even though this is bound still by parts of antibody, strep pneumoniae goes undetected. What else does strep pneumoniae have that prevents its phagocytosis? It has a capsule. And we talked about the importance of a capsule is that, it, again, it kind of hides some of those PAMPs or those pathogen-associated molecular patterns that would be recognized by the PRRs on the surface of macrophages and neutrophils. Is this slowly starting to come back a little bit? All right, where are we at with time? Okay. All right, let's finish out with um, just two minutes. What I'd like you to do is start working on number nine here, and this is where we'll pick up then on Monday. So it asks for you, what are the structural, or what are, compare and contrast an endotoxin and an exotoxin. Um, you may recall from the mini lecture, there is a table in there that basically says, Here are, here's a comparison of these two. Um, what I'd like you to do is take two minutes and start to jot down some basic features, and this is where we will come back to on, on Monday. Okay? So take two minutes, and then I got one last announcement for the day.